Hello. What's going on over there, Alex? No, I'm sorry. There's no one called Alex here. I think you've got the wrong number. Um, can I help? Alex, I... I have, um... You're throwing everything you've got at us, Alex. We're supposed to be allies, you maniac. I'm the one that put you into office. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There's no need for name calling. I don't know who Alex is, but I'm not him. His legacy phones are rubbish. I don't give a wooden nickel about your legacy. You call them off. Alex? You call them off. You know, we'll retaliate. Retaliate? I don't know who you think this is, but I think you've got the wrong number. I think you need to check and dial again. Landlines, am I right? Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David, and as the world prepares to say goodbye to the publicly switched telephone network, or plain old telephone system, depending on where you live, I thought it was a good time to look at some old phones. Okay, so we have two phones here and they're very clearly different. One is clearly electronic and the other is electromechanical. But because they represent sort of a cross section of the history throughout the publicly switched telephone network or plain old telephone system, depending on where you come from, I thought it was a good exact time to have a look at the two different types. Mostly because these are awesome. I hope for fairly obvious reasons, both of these phones originate from the UK and are compatible with the UK telephone system. My first big bugbear about that is the fact that BT or British Telecom use their own bespoke connector. And I've no idea why, I don't know what's wrong with RJ11 or RJ14, but they do. And that makes it a pain. If you've ever tried to travel internationally with a laptop that had a dial-up modem, you'll know what I mean. But this is the classic rotary dial electromechanical telephone. And Everything about it is barely electrical, mostly mechanical, even down to the ringer. And you can tell when it rings, it can only be made by a ringing bell. I think it was Technology Connections did a really good video where he was describing why you could clearly tell in a lot of Hollywood films, the ringing phone noise is not recorded on set. It's a sound effect because the sound or the pitch of the bells sort of rises and falls. It has sort of wow to it, which you only get from playing back a recording. Once you hear it, you can't unhear it. Hello? And of course you've got emergency calls for fire, police and ambulance done 999. Obviously these days 112 will work Definitely anywhere in Europe. I think it might be going more international than that. Uh, I'd be interested to know if it works in the States, but just in case anyone doesn't know 911. So this is the receiver, the famous receiver. And for anybody that is lucky enough to be that young and doesn't know where that symbol originates from for hang up and answer a call, there's your answer. So let's start with the receiver because I think these should unscrew reasonably easily and reveal how basic this is. Speaker at the top microphone at the bottom and the nice red cord. I obviously had to go for red. We all know it was the encoder phone to Moscow. If you've ever watched a Bond film or played Red Alert 2 like I clearly did. Tele 8746G BT QC CCF batch sampled FWR831 supplied by British Telecom BT Rented. Whoops. Approved for use with telecommunication systems by British Telecoms in accordance with the conditions in the instructions for use. Now, you see down there it says PO, because before British Telecom was known as BT, it was a uh, post office. Um, and you can still see on manhole covers around uh, GPO, General Post Office, on old sort of manhole covers for telephone connectors in the street. So I would assume that this center panel of the dial comes out. Oh yes. So this is a mechanism immediately behind the dial. And you can see as I rotate these two pins, which would have been interlocked with the dial, it turns this little gear, which runs this nylon gear against this really steep worm. And as that rotates, there are these two little counterweights inside here. And the faster you spin this, 
the further they fly out and rub on the outside of this case. And that slows the dial down, which gives you a very controlled speed for the return. So the faster it turns, the harder it presses, and it's a self-regulating feedback loop. Okay, the insides. You can tell this is a later one because there's a lot of plastic involved in the manufacturer. Uh, a lot of early ones would have been almost exclusively electrical. I'm surprised at the number of terminals in here too, because this should have been a very general use telephone. And I actually wonder if the model could be used in other configurations, maybe on um, internal like uh, PBX, like it, where buildings have their own internal large relays. Let's take off these four. Got white, blue, red, and green. So the white and blue are the mouthpiece and the earpiece makes that much easier to rewind that phone cable to get it looking neat again. Now, I don't want anyone to think I've got OCD, but when I worked in an office that had office phones, every time I used to see one get like this, I would like use my lunch times to recoil it to make it neat again. Huge, huge lumps of metal in here that actuate the, uh, the receiver and a nice beefy micro switch next to a relay Interesting. Sounds like it's making two steps. I can't say I've ever known there being a need or indeed anything functional about having two steps. So I'm curious, might have to dig into that further. Okay, so this is the incoming phone line. You'll notice three cores are wired up despite the BT connector being six core. Okay, let me see if I can get the dial out are wonderfully made. So these, these two metal tabs at the front just hold in there with a single screw at the back. So this is really modular. This would be very easy to uh, service and repair. Interesting, off the back of the dialer, we've got one, two, three, four, five terminals. One, two, three, four, five. Nice and clearly laid out, exactly as you would expect. So now we're looking at the back of the dialer and if I move that again, you can see this cam design on the outside. So you've got a little notch on the back of the cam, which releases this switch, which then makes two more contacts. And this one up here, which pulses as you dial. So depending on how far you've drawn that round, that would be a zero, nine, eight. You see this switch over here makes eight pulses as it goes round. And that's how it dulls a number. This is called pulse dialing for exactly that reason, which is why on old systems or systems that are still backwards compatible, you can actually dial a number entirely by doing this. Yes, it's laborious and it's not all that reliable. You have to be very quick and regular with your timing, but it is possible. Um, I have tried on this phone uh, to ring my mobile. Aha! That, I believe, is a little capacitor. It was just across these two terminals here, which, if memory serves, were the earpiece. So there's a capacitor across the earpiece. So just to keep track, so the earpiece ran up, that connection across the earpiece was up here, and that is one of the cores of that switch. So this switch was made to the earpiece, so that means you can hear it dialing the pulses as it dials. And here is possibly my favorite part, the ringer. Again, with a resistor again across it, a very modern looking resistor. So I'm assuming that's a modern addition, but I can't place why. Maybe because this just worked on my standard PSTN line. Oh, this is so lovely. Just these two little solenoids that make and break a circuit in turn as they're energized and ring that little hammer between the two bells. That should free up the circuit board. Yes, lovely. Oh, it's a printed circuit board. Very, um, can I say vintage one? 
So T19, oh look, there's a part in it. So all of these four terminals were linked together. Let's just put a screw down so I don't lose them. Some very old parts on here. And what's funny is just how configurable this is. Because um, we've got a bank of traces across here that are already connected. One down here, one over there. So technically all of those banks, those terminals across the bottom are free to be used with whatever uh, jumpers and terminals you need. Whereas these ones at the top are actually configured to attach to the circuitry. So there's a lot of sort of configuration you can do by adjusting jumpers, adding uh, extra leads and things. A very clever little design. I don't know what that is though, this big bank over here, is that a resistor bank? It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine leads. It says 209CSBM. I will make sure that I look that up and uh, include in the lower thirds below. Obviously you've got individual resistors. Oh. They're like two little glass tubes in a package. Two legs each. So those two legs there and those two legs there actually go into these little glass vials. What would they be? They're in a package, but that's nothing electrical. I mean, there are no transistors on here. Are they just really tiny effective tubes? That doesn't, no, because they would need more, more than two legs. Or is it a ridiculous kind of opto isolator? But again, they're both glass tubes. I mean, I wasn't expecting to find anything like that. Interesting. I feel that this phone is absolutely iconic and it's a travesty that it won't really work. Um, when the publicly switched telephone network or old analog phone lines or POTS, if you want to call it that, get switched off, to make old hardware work, you will need an ATA, an analog telephone adapter and I'm not sure they're gonna support pulse dialing. Uh, and as a result, this will cease to work. And I wonder how much of this is worth preserving and how much of it's worth using in a project or something to uh, maintain the function elements like the dial, like the handset, like the receiver, but actually building new hardware in that will make this an IP rotary phone. Would that be a fun project? If that's something you'd be interested in seeing, let me know over at the Element 14 community, element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. In the meantime, let's have a look at the 90s phone. Okay, so time rolls around. We're no longer using pulse dialing. We are using the modern conveniences of tone dialing, which is a mixed blessing because it's far quicker, more reliable. You don't have to wait for that dial, but you can do things electronically. You can have presets, saved speed dials, in a lot more of a cost-effective device than uh, you might have had for pulse dialing. Um, but you can also communicate using the pulses and the tones. Um, there were certain phones that actually had the ability to switch between pulsed and tone dialing um, just to give them maximum compatibility. I certainly had one growing up that had the switch and both worked on the phone network it was used on. And of course, this one is an answer machine as well and it takes these beautiful little tiny micro cassettes um, and a 30 minute or a one hour micro cassette in one of these seems really over the top. Um, but you've got to bear in mind these were consumable because they had a habit of rewinding to the beginning of the tape and playing the outgoing message again and again and recording the first message in the same place as the tape. That tape would wear out fast. So now the handset is doing much more of the heavy lifting and I think I can pop that cable out. But because it's got the dialer on it and this integrated display, I'm half expecting to find a lot more hardware up here. It can be interesting to see what stayed on the handset and what's on the receiver. I think we're gonna find the tone dialing hardware on the receiver, uh, purely because I can't think of any reason why it would need to exist on the base. Because although it answers the phone for the answer machine, it didn't have to dial any numbers. Okay. Oh yeah, that's definitely a display driver. At the top, it's on the back of this screen. Oh, there goes the uh, earpiece. 
Interesting they folded the capacitors down as cable strain relief, which is probably not the worst thing in the world, but uh, just out of interest, look at the discoloration of between the plastics. And um, actually that's something I find really annoying um, in the UK because BT technically own the line as it comes into your house, presents the BT master socket at your front door as close as they can get so they can say we own the line to that point. A lot of phone points tended to be right at the front door. So your telephone would be next to the front door getting all that sunlight bleached in which was a massive disadvantage when we came to installing broadband and routers and things because you don't really want that at the front of the house you want that in the middle of the house to get your best wi-fi coverage so that's something that we've had to learn from and overcome in the last 20 years ish 15 years ish since everybody got broadband and wi-fi routers oh lovely Ooh, membrane buttons with lots of buttons Oh, whoops, we'll come back to the screen. This is a very strange configuration of two PCBs sandwiched together. And I don't mean dual layer PCBs. Um, there is two that overlap like this. Um, that's strange. Ah, oh, look, pulse and tone. So we did actually have a switch on here that would enable you to do tone dialing. I hadn't seen that right in the bottom of the uh, handset. So this at the top, I'm going to guess is a display driver uh, because right on the other side of that board was this tiny little display. This LCD display is connected using this little zebra connector. And I think I covered these before in the Game & Watch teardown where these are electrically conductive but only in one direction. So it's made up of lots and lots and lots of tiny little stripes of connect conductivity that go this way. The traces on the board across here they make connectivity, but not left and right. And I forget what the name for those is. Um, you can get other materials as well, like gels and tapes and things that are only conductive in one direction, which are awesome. And there is a proper name for them. And I'm sorry, I can't remember that off the top of my head. And um, I suggest that this little IC here is probably uh, a tone generator. I'm not sure how much functionality of that will actually drive the phone and how much of that will just be generating the tone signals because tone dialing is actually a combination of two frequencies and it works in a grid. So the frequency on the top row of numbers is a combination of one frequency and one of three others. Similarly, if you go down, there's a different combination. So each number is a unique frequency which gives you those weird, horrible bloop noises that you'd get from dialing a phone number. So there's not all that much to the handset. And I think the handset probably works 90% as a phone almost on its own. And I kind of wonder if we actually rewired this and plugged it into a phone line, whether it would actually work. Oh yeah, there's much more in here as well as cobwebs. Oh, interesting. I'm pretty sure this is speakerphone volume as opposed to just any volume. I can hear how crunchy that potentiometer is. It's interesting this one's actually got a barrel jack. So most phones, the, the, the old phone, the red phone, uh, drew all its power from the phone line. So even in a power cut, you could still receive phone calls, which was always a strange experience. But it's not a huge amount of power. It's, it's 50 volts nominal. It fluctuates as the phone rings or is answered, but it's only like one amp or something. And I don't even think you'd get 50 watts out of it if you tried. So it's interesting that as soon as you've got these electromechanical systems for the tape drive and everything else, that you need a barrel jack to power it. With that said, how's that gonna work after the PSTN switched off? When we have to go to IP phones only, if we need to make an emergency call, are they just assuming everybody's got a mobile that will work? Okay, those two door to -pours, which were fitted in the front of here, which had some tack switches, some sliding switches, and a couple of LEDs, they're dumb. I mean, you can pretty much work out there's more or less uh, a common ground and an input for each of the signals on there. So there's nothing to it, I'm afraid. They are nothing. So all the effort of answer machine amplification for loudspeaker call handling when you're playing the outgoing message finding that outgoing message is all done by this device and this pcb the belt that should have driven this is uh, well it's not a belt anymore it's just smush yeah you can see why this device didn't work oh no what a nightmare <laughs> oh no it's getting worse not better uh, you know what, I'm just gonna wash my hands.
Okay, back with marginally cleaner hands. Now this is shaping up to be awesome. So what I'm deducing here is that you drive this motor from an H bridge. You see this, uh, this sort of blue and purple contacts here, which basically the traces come through onto the motor. Depending on which way you drive the motor, the belt was around this. And you can see if I drive it one way, then a cog pushes it that way. But if I drive it the other way, drives it to its limits the other way. There's this really cool configuration of this little sort of idler gear that's attached to the back of this big flywheel. But depending on which way you start rotating, it depends on how it behaves. Okay, um, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and guess the outgoing message is on one side of the tape, so playback direction one way, and then it record, well, basically towards the end of the tape on the rear side, and then it would play the other way and record the incoming message. That's clever. And I wonder if that's why tones on old answer machines used to be so long. Because it would say, you'd record your outgoing message and it would be, please leave your message after the beep. Then it would be a beep, but it was always unnecessarily long and it was electronically generated. So it's not coming off the tape, it's coming out of the circuitry while this reverses direction. You can see there's this micro switch down here. So outgoing message, outgoing message, please leave your message after the beep. Beep. Till it starts recording the other direction. That makes so much sense. So on here, do we have anything interesting of note? I'm going to guess probably not. And we've got some Hitachi that's probably an audio amplifier. It's quite a large IC here. In a dip package, it's a, a 130466E. I mean, we've got the 9409 September 1994. That kind of makes sense. But unfortunately, that number at the top seems to have been used by some uh, connectors. So all the search results tend to lead there. But I wonder what that does. I mean, is that a dedicated IC that did an answer machine in, were there enough to make a bespoke IC? I mean, I guess there would have been. In that kind of time period in the mid 1990s, everyone had an answer machine. I don't think voicemail on mobile phones was quite there yet. There was a service later offered by BT that sort of superseded uh, having your own answer machine. So. Was that a phone controller on a chip, a phone and tape controller? I don't see why it wouldn't have been. If you can find more information on that, let me know. These two phones are just a different, different beast, aren't they? The phone from the 90s is mass produced, electronics. I don't feel it has any of the charm and personality of the red rotary phone. That noise, the mechanical engineering that goes into the dialing, that, how you feel when you interact with it, versus the touchtone telephone with an answering machine, which has got so much going on inside, but it's just all electronically separated from the real world. And I would quite happily safely recycle the, uh, the touchtone answer machine without a second thought. But the rotary phone, it makes me want to do something useful with it for posterity's sakes, something to maintain that feel. And I don't know, maybe in another 30 years, everybody will pine for the, uh, the 90s and I'll feel bad for having not kept the other one alive in some way, shape or form. But for me now, certainly, I definitely like the nostalgia that comes with the older electronics, the ones that I feel are definitely worth saving. To me, the end of the publicly switched telephone network raises a few interesting challenges. And a lot of these are actually around safety. I don't think people realize how many systems are actually based on drawing power from the telephone line or relying on that basic functionality to keep working. If you think about the call buttons in lifts, they are often PSTN, direct connections to a telephone line. Uh, auto dialers from intruder alarms and systems like that. They have to be secure, they will have their own dedicated phone lines. What happens to those when the public telephone system gets switched off? If you start introducing analog converters, power failures to a building become a real issue for safety critical systems. On the flip side of that, there are other systems which will stop working, I hope, like fax machines. If you're still using a fax machine, you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. Start using a scanner and email. Either way, I hope you found this an interesting teardown. 
If you've got an idea for a teardown, or you've got an idea for what I could do with the rotary phone, because I definitely want to do something with it, please head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Let me know what you think. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.